Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dan Seabolt from the York County Historical Committee. And on behalf of the committee, I welcome you. It is an honor to have with us today Thomas Nelson, Jr., as portrayed by Jim Gallagher. A retired Air Force Colonel with 27 years of service, Jim is a living historian, reenactor, and interpreter, as well as an advisor to and an actor in multiple film, television, and museum productions. He has appeared as Thomas Nelson, Jr. in several different venues, including an upcoming PBS documentary to be aired in advance of the 250th anniversary of the Yorktown Tea Party. So please bear with us. And now, the date is November 6th, 1774. Thomas Nelson, Jr. is addressing the citizens of Yorktown and presenting the case for action to enforce the boycott of tea and goods enacted by the Continental Congress. Please welcome the Honorable Thomas Nelson, Jr. I hope you are equally as kind at the end. So I am Thomas Nelson, Jr., and as you know, citizens of Yorktown, we are facing a crisis. We have gathered here once before to discuss this crisis, and we took decisive action. But now, the moment is upon us. We have, in the harbor, at anchor, the ship Virginia, owned by Mr. John Norton of London, merchant, which arrived on the 1st of November, captained by John Eston, carrying two half chests of tea, ordered by Mr. John Prentice of Williamsburg. I'm sure you're familiar with him. We do not come to this juncture lightly. There have been numerous British impositions upon these colonies, going back to the time before this town was even formed. The first of those being the original Navigation Act of 1690, an act which forbade us from manufacturing here in the colonies and forces us to send anything we take from the ground, harvest from our fields, take from the ocean. All of that must go to England for sale. We are forbidden from retail sales here. And as you well know, that significantly strangles our economy. There's numerous other points of juncture, and we will never be able to cover them all. I'm relying upon your memory for some. But an important point of juncture was the death of our prior sovereign, King George II. George II took a laissez-faire in the French approach to governing the American colonies. George believed that, well, in the words of some locals, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And he considered us not to be broken. George II allowed us to appoint our own sheriffs, to appoint our own juries, to appoint our own judges, to elect our own legislatures, assemblies, and burgesses, and to create our own laws, which when were approved by our governor, and if approved, sent to London where they were approved by the king or vetoed, which George II rarely did. However, upon his death, that laissez-faire approach disappeared. His death occurred at a critical juncture during the midst of what we call the French and Indian War, what the British called the Seven Years' War. Now, I would note that the Seven Years' War began in 1755 and ended in 1783. And if you're not capable of doing that math, perhaps there's a reason why your treasury is empty. <laughs> but upon his death, the monarchy was not ready to be transferred to the next king because the issue was in doubt. The young George III was not yet of age, was unmarried, and was the grandson of George II. And the logic was, why skip a generation when you have the second son of George II available to assume the throne? And the second son of George II was the Duke of Cumberland. And as you remember, he still is the Duke of Cumberland. He was waging war against the French and winning. You will recall that it was a spectacular victory, the largest and greatest victory in British history. They gained all of Canada, the two Floridas, three sugar islands in the Caribbean, maintained the Rock of Gibraltar and access to the Mediterranean, 
and two trade routes to the Orient. So the Duke of Cumberland was important. So the monarchy, as a result of this debate amongst the monarchists, the throne lay vacant for 11 months until finally George III was crowned in September, almost a year later. Now you've all heard the phrase that power abhors a vacuum. And of course, in this case, the abhorrence was Parliament, who exerted their own mission and usurped the power that should have been on the throne and took it for themselves and began passing the 32 laws which we now know and hate that have been passed since 1762 until today that govern our economy, our society, and our liberty. And we can talk about the Sugar Act, we can talk about the Currency Act, the Molasses Act, the Stamp Act, ad infinitum. But the most important experience that we've had here in America is the Townsend Acts. During the Townsend Acts passed in 1769, we banded together across these 13 colonies, those 12 then, didn't have Georgia yet, and we established embargoes and boycotts of British goods, which forced the repeal of the Townsend Acts. We know how to do this. Embargoes and boycotts can work. Now, subsequent to that, we did endure the Boston Massacre, which perhaps sets a different tone in New England than it does here in Virginia. But that leads us to where the, we are in the present situation, the Tea Act. Passed last year, in August of 1773, the Tea Act changes our relationship relative to the Townsend Acts. Now, when the Townsend Acts were repealed, they did not repeal the tax on tea. In fact, they issued the Declaratory Act. And the Declaratory Act says we shall have a tax on tea because we are parliament and we can tax you. At that point in time, the Townsend tea tax was an ad valorem tax, 25% of the value of the tea. A very steep tax. So you would think that the Tea Act of last year has done us a favor because it's reduced the tax to a mere 10%, two shillings per pound, or two pence per pound. And the tea sells for about two shillings. So you would think that we would be in favor of this, but it does still perpetuate Parliament's insistence that they can tax us without our representation. And the really galling point of the matter is why the Tea Act was passed. And that's because of the British East India Company. And I realize this is regurgitation, but I must ask you to endure. The British East India Company remains the largest stock, privately stock held company in the world. Parliament considers it too big to fail. It's been subject to parliamentary inquest in the past because their financial dealings are suspect. And we know this. They have their own army operating in the Orient. You will remember that in 1769, a mere four years ago, our House of Burgesses passed an act which placed a tax on the sale of slaves. That act was approved by our governor, Bodetort, sent on to London for approval by the king, where it was interdicted by the Privy Council at the behest of the East India Company, because the East India Company was and is the largest exporter of slaves in the world, and introducing a tax that would retard the sale of slaves here in the colonies was viewed as an attack on its financial status, and the king vetoed it. George III would not allow that law to go into effect. Now, he also sent back word via the Privy Council that no governor in the 13 colonies, in the American colonies, should send a law, another law of that sort to the king for approval. And as you know, Governor Bodetort died in 1770, and 
the governorship of Virginia passed to the head, the president of the Council of Virginia, the governor's council, who happened to be my father, William Nelson. And no one had told William Nelson not to send another act of that sort to the king, so we passed it again and sent it once more time with the same result, all to protect the East India Company's financial status. Last, or two years ago in 1772, the East India Company's financial status was so poor that they applied to Parliament for a 1.7 million pound loan to keep them financially afloat. And Parliament granted it. So this company is now, the major stockholder in this company is Parliament. But as for the other stockholders, it's no surprise to learn that Parliament is heavily invested there also. Public stockholders of the 522 members of Parliament, 460 of them are stockholders in the East India Company. Some small incentive to keep it financially afloat, yes? Now, we must consider that we are a huge tea market to the British. And of course, they favor sending us the Bohi tea, the lowest grade of tea. Because we are not considered to be connoisseurs. But in fact, what has happened is the British East India Company has failed to properly survey their market. Do we have coffee drinkers here? Yes. Coffee? Yes. Yeah, so our, our tastes are changing. Chocolate? Anyone drinking chocolate? We're moving away from tea because other staples are available to us. Plus, with the Townsend duty on tea, that 25% tax, it's much cheaper to purchase the imported Dutch tea. Now, I won't go into whether that's legal or not. As you may well know, we have contacts in the Caribbean where the Dutch colonies legally imported. And in the Caribbean, it's legal for the Caribbean British colonies to trade with those Dutch colonies. So some of that Dutch tea is arriving legally. And of course, it's much cheaper, cheaper and a finer quality than the British Bohe <coughs> tea. The result is that the British East India Company has continued to import tea despite our changing tastes and our changing desire to remain untaxed. And there's now three million pounds of it, if you can imagine three million pounds of tea, that lies rotting in British warehouses. Thus, we have the Tea Act. Let's reduce the price of the tea. Let's send it to America. Let's give the British East India Company a monopoly on this, on this product. And we will reduce by forcing Americans to drink our product, we will reduce the surplus that we have in our warehouses. And this is the purview of Parliament, our government, to support a financially burdened public company. Now we knew that this was coming. The word of the Tea Act leaked to our correspondents in London, and they've passed it to us. We knew where the ships were coming, we knew how much would be on board, and we knew who the tea agents would be here in America. And the rejection of that tea was not just in Boston. Before those first shipments arrived last December, Americans, the Sons of Liberty, were already protesting the Tea Act and dissuading, gently speaking, those tea agents from accepting those shipments. Strangely enough, when the shipments arrived, there was no one here to receive them. Some considered it better for their health. But there were very few instances where the tea was actually destroyed. So tea rejections happened all up and down our coastal territories. The strangest was in Annapolis, just a few days ago. In that particular instance, the, there were four owners of the ship, one of whom was in Britain, smuggled two tons of tea aboard the ship, wrapped in bundles of linen cloth to disguise it. 
He did not tell the ship's captain. He did not tell the passengers. He did not send a forewarning letter to America to warn the other three owners in Annapolis. During the voyage, the ship was also carrying indentured servants. And during the voyage, those indentured servants discovered the smuggled tea and informed the captain. And upon the captain's arrival, he informed his owners in Annapolis, who realized that he was in dire jeopardy. And a compromise was reached. He would offload the indentured servants so no harm came to them, take the ship into the harbor, and burn it along with its cargo of tea. And that was the compromise. So you see, we are not alone in our consideration of this moment. It has happened to others before. Although for us, it's a bit different. But first, let's rehash this situation that resulted from the so-called Tea Party in Boston. And that is the Parliament extracted revenge. Uh, what they called the coercive acts, and we have called come to term the intolerable acts. The Boston Port Act held them to pay for the cost of the tea that was disposed. The Government Act rewrote the colony's charter, abolished free legislation, installed martial law, took away their liberties. The Justice Act authorized the governor to send accused criminals to trial in Britain. So if you were accused of a trial, of a crime here in America, you would be sent to Britain to stand trial. Anyone who wanted to be, or, or you needed as a witness, would have to travel at their own expense to Britain. A trip, mind you, that takes five or six weeks on the best of occasions. And an unknown trial curriculum. Thus losing their livelihood here in America while they waited the slow wheels of justice. My cousin George Washington, a planter in Northern Virginia, calls this the murdering act because it allows British soldiers to commit a um, an act of murder against Americans, such as the Boston Massacre, then be transported to Britain where they will face a trial, not of their peers here in America, but of British jury enabling them to get away with the crime. Now, of course, the Quartering Act requires for us, all of the colonies, this applies in all 13 of our colonies, 12 of our colonies, pardon me, it applies to all of us in that we are forced to house and feed the British troops that are here stationed on our soil. Now, we have never actually required British troops, let us be clear. The French and Indian War alleviated us of the French threat on our boundaries. We are, in fact, engaged at this point in time in a native war, but we are capable of handling that ourselves, as Governor Dunmore is proceeding with. But stationed right now in Boston, in November of 1774, are more British troops than were sent to all of America to fight the French and Indian War. And they are here not because we are threatened from our boundaries. They are here because Britain is threatened by us. And yet we are forced to pay for their quarters and their sustenance. Finally, there's the Quebec Act. And this is the most despicable of all for us in Virginia. Parliament was divided on this act, but passed it anyway as a part of a punitive package intended against all Americans. It extends the Quebec boundary far beyond its present past territory and essentially takes all of Virginia's Northwest Territory from it. Even worse, it funnels the Native Americans into a small strip of land, a reserve positioned between Quebec and the 13 colonies, which is almost guaranteed to result in friction and further conflict. Now, I don't happen to be overly concerned about popism, but many are. And it also allows the Catholic, French, Canadians 
to travel down into our neck of the woods, so to speak, and extends French civil law, which is not a trial by jury, it's a trial by a papist judge, which does offend many of our fellow countrymen. And when I talk about a large swath of territory, it's that pink section up there. So that's the before and the after. I show this because many are not familiar with the extent of Virginia's western boundary. So, what did we do about this? And that's what's important here, and this is where it's leading you today, to your decision today. So protest. Americans obviously are going to protest these acts. They're unfair. They're irresponsible. They're repressing an entire colony, 240,000 people, for the actions of only 50. Sons of Liberty disguised as redskin painted Indians who dumped the tea into the harbor of Boston. Now, our committees of correspondence have shared letters. We have come up with plans of action. And everyone recognizes that these are authoritarian acts that threatens our liberty. Not only to Massachusetts and to New England, but extending throughout the colonies, including here in Virginia. Therefore, we are not idle bystanders. On the 26th of May, our House of Burgesses, of which I am a member, called for a day of fasting and prayer in support of Boston, for which our governor, Lord Dunmore, reprised with disbanding of our House of Burgesses, preventing us from taking any legal action or even passing the laws that were on, us, on our calendar to effect. That resulted in the establishment of the Virginia Association. The Virginia Association is extra legal, meaning that it is not within the bounds of law. British law allows us to have an assembly, a house of burgesses, but it does not allow us to gather outside of that. And since the governor has prorogued our legislature, has disbanded our legislature, this Virginia convention is illegal under British law. The Virginia Association called for meetings in every county of Virginia, and ours was held here in this room on July the 19th, just past. And we adopted a set of resolves pledging our allegiance to the cause of liberty in America. They were unanimously adopted. All of you voted in favor of standing up for your rights as British citizens. Now, here at Yorktown, we resolved to boycott tea as well as other British goods, including slaves. And you elected myself and Mr. Diggs to represent you at the Virginia Convention in August, which we did and took your resolves forward, and those resolves echoed in the counties across the colony and were adopted by the Virginia Convention. And those boycotts and embargoes were put in place to take effect on 1 November of 1774. When did the Virginia arrive in port? 1 November. Further, the Virginia Convention nominated a set of delegates to go to this new Continental Congress that gathered in Philadelphia, just completing its session last week. And during its session, the leader of our delegation, Peyton Randolph, was elected as the president of Continental Congress. And Peyton Randolph, along with Mr. Richard Henry Lee, introduced our resolves, our ideas for boycotts and embargoes to the Continental Congress, and it was adopted. The embargo on tea took effect on the 20th of October, just last week, and the rest of them go into effect in December. Now I brought you back to the beginning. I've laid out before you the reason why this is a challenge for us, the reason why we must act, the reason why we must support the Continental Congress. 
In Boston, the reaction, the Tea Party, was a reaction to the tea tax and the illicit, illicit support by Parliament of a private company. Here in Yorktown, it's a bit different. We are the first to experience an importation of tea since the Continental Congress embargo on tea went into effect, since our own elected embargo on tea went into effect. The eyes of the continent are upon us. Will we allow this tea to land and be sold, or will we take the actions that echo those of other towns and cities across the American colonies and dispose of it and make tea for the fish? Now, this is the point at which I cease being Mr. Nelson. Because you don't know the answer, do you? You don't know what they did, and that's why we're here, because we want to talk about what they did. So let's, let's fast forward. First off, the Tea Act was widely rejected, not only in America, but also in Britain. This is a political cartoon that originated in Britain, not here in America. This was in the London Times. And this, tea, this political cartoon portrays the Tea Act as the rape of America. It's fairly harsh for that period of time. This political cartoon was reprinted 41 times in 41 different newspapers, including here in America. So the boycott on East India Company tea did take effect here in Virginia on 1 September. That's what our Virginia Convention decided. The Continental boycott took effect on the 20th of October. The Virginia arrived in port on the 1st of November. And the challenge is that Captain Esten, John Norton, and John Prentice all knew that Yorktown and Virginia had entered into an embargo on tea before it was ordered. The Virginia was actually here in port in Yorktown until the 3rd of August of 1774. So Captain Esten was aware that Yorktown had passed an embargo. He was aware that Virginia, the Virginia Convention had passed an embargo and that it would take effect on the 1st of September. He knew this. So did Prentice. And John Norton knew it because Thomas Nelson wrote him a letter. He placed an order for merchant goods. Nelson was a merchant here in Yorktown. He placed a, an order for mercantile goods and told Norton about the embargo. Interestingly enough, Nelson's letter placing the order and Prentice's order for tea went to England on board the Virginia on the same ship at the same time. So Norton knew this was happening. But yet he sent the tea anyway, and you have to wonder if it was a test. Uh, the other interesting part is that Eston departed on the 3rd of August, and he made a round trip from here to England and back in a sailing vessel in just 13 weeks. Almost unprecedented timing. You have to understand that they were testing the water. Norton was deliberately testing to see if the tea would be rejected. And in his orders, to Captain Esten, he ordered Captain Esten to declare the tea as soon as he arrived. Because he thought if the tea was going to be rejected, it would just stay on board the ship and go home. So this knowledge agitated the people of Yorktown. They started to understand that this was a test. It really was a test. So very quickly after the arrival of the Virginia, the people of Yorktown and the people of, of, of Gloucester were aware that the tea was on board the ships. The Yorktown prevented the ship from coming to the wharf. It demanded that the, the Virginia anchor out rather than dock at the wharf because they didn't want the tea to be smuggled off without their knowledge. So there were guards placed on the, on the waterfront at Yorktown who watched the ship, the comings and going of rowboats to the ship to make sure the tea was not smuggled into the town. The other pertinent fact here is that 
Governor Dunmore was not in Williamsburg. Um, Governor Dunmore was on the frontier of the colony at a place called Point Pleasant, which is now uh, Parkersburg, West Virginia, and he was fighting a Native American uprising. The proclamation line, which prevented Americans from settling beyond the Allegheny Mount, or the Appalachian Mountains, had gone into effect. But several years later, there was a negotiation of some of that territory because Americans already were beyond it. And it was called the Treaty of Fort Stanwix, which, Stanwix, which modified the proclamation line. Some of the natives disagreed with that. And so there was an uprising, and Dunmore was out on the, on the frontier. So that was very advantageous for us here in Yorktown because we weren't worried about the governor mustering troops to come in here and oppose anything we might want to do. So this is a, this is a picture of of uh, Mr. Prentice's store as it appeared in 1940 before Colonial Williamsburg restored it. And of course, I know many of you have been to Williamsburg and you've seen Prentice's store today. It is the same store. It is the original building. Uh, the street has been returned to its natural level, so you still, now you go down three steps to get down to the street level. Uh, but what really happened was that on November 3rd, Continental Congress embargo, the word of, of it and the, and the uh, the language of it, reached Williamsburg. And it was brought back by Peyton Randolph, who was the leader of our delegation and had been elected to the President of Continental Congress. Um, and so both of, the, both of the guests, Purdy and Dixon and Clementine and Ryan's papers, both printed the text of the embargoes on the third. And so here's the T riding at anchor in the harbor and the newspaper on the very front page of the newspaper in fact, if you want to look at it afterwards, I, I took the liberty of printing some copies so you can see it's on the very front page of the newspaper where it describes what Continental Congress has done in terms of the embargo. So, so it was right in our face. It was right in the face of the people of Yorktown. They knew what Continental Congress had done and they wanted to support the Congress. This was support for our liberties. So Friday afternoon, after reading this, there was a meeting, basically the meeting we're having now. There was a meeting in this room, in York Hall, and the townspeople, once again, unanimously decided what they were going to do. Um, and what they decided was to send a letter for guidance to the House of Burgesses in Williamsburg. Now this is somewhat of a cover story, because the House of Burgesses was not in session at that point. The governor had prorogued them, right? They were, they were dismissed. Um, so who they're really sending it to was to the Virginia Committee of Safety. Unfortunately for Yorktown, the Virginia Committee of Safety was feared for its own safety in Williamsburg, and so it had distanced itself from the British government and was meeting in Richmond. So the message did not arrive in time. Where it was sent instead was to Peyton Randolph. He received it in Williamsburg. And when Randolph received it, he realized he could not do a thing. Because if an elected official of Virginia had gotten involved in this, it would have been treasonous. It would have been a, an opposition to parliamentary law. So they never responded. Yorktown, Gloucester never got a response to their message. However, tea was the talk of the Sunday services. And on a Sunday like this, people gathered after the services to talk. And of course, Captain Esten was present at the services. So Esten was well aware of the plan. And the plan was, we're going to send a message. We're going to wait for them to meet. They were assured that the Burgesses would talk about this at 8 o'clock on Monday morning. They were going to wait for them to meet. It's a two-hour trip from, by fast rider from Williamsburg to Yorktown. So we'll wait to receive word on Monday morning. And then we'll do what the Burgesses recommend. But they never got that response. So what did happen was that at 8 o'clock on Monday morning, the townspeople gathered, and it was a large crowd. They waited until 10 o'clock. Having heard no word in that two-hour period, the time it would take a writer to get here from Williamsburg, they decided to send a delegation out to the ship. Now, they did not know what to expect from the ship or the ship's crew in response to this. So the delegation was probably fairly heavy on the thug side, as you can imagine. But Nelson did go with them. By noon, they still had received no word, so they took it upon themselves to do what they wanted to do, which was to toss the tea into the water. It was hoisted out of the, out of the hold, 
it was opened, and Nelson himself poured the tea into the harbor. And just a few minutes after Nelson did that, the delegation from Gloucester arrived. And I say delegation again in quotes because it was probably fairly heavy on the Thug and Billy Club side. But in fact, the crew of the Virginia were sympathetic. They stood by. They even assisted in getting the tea out of the hold. Um, and it really was a non-event. It was very similar to Boston in that no property other than the tea was damaged. And that's where there's some myths about the Boston Tea Party. But just as in here in Virginia, you can see these boxes. Now these are not half chests, these are quarter chests. But you can see these boxes are not nailed closed. These are reproductions. They open with a simple latch. Nobody needs to attack these boxes with a tomahawk to get them open. They are sealed with candle wax run around the rim. They are airtight. If you throw the box over the side with the tea in it, it floats. So that's not how the tea was destroyed in Boston or here at York. The boxes were opened and the tea simply poured out. So there's lots of myths about, about the Boston Tea Party. These boxes are modeled after the only remaining box from the Boston Tea Party that washed ashore the next morning. It's called the Robinson Tea Box. So afterwards, Mr. Prentice, as you can imagine, was very apologetic um, and, and begged profusely to be forgiven. He was, come, he was made to come to meet the, the uh, Virginia Committee of Safety and issue his apology. His apology was then later printed in the Virginia Gazette in Williamsburg. And that is this portion of the document. It's down here in the lower corner. And the portion of the document above is the Virginia Gazette's report from the Gloucester position of what happened on the Yorktown Tea Party. There was also a report from the Yorktown side of the river. Um, Captain Eston also printed an apology, but he was issued a penalty. He was ordered to go home empty. In other words, he was not allowed to make a profit off of this trip. The committees then went after John Norton, who they knew was the instigator of this. But Norton was important. John Norton was a personal friend of Thomas Nelson's. He was a supplier of many mercantile goods throughout the colony of Virginia. In fact, his son, Robert, was apprenticed to Thomas Nelson right here in Yorktown. So Yorktown was very careful in how they approached reprisal to John Norton. They condemned him, but they still continued to order goods from him. Norton did send a letter of apology and explanation, which reads very hollow when you read it today, because you, we now know, because we can put all the documents together, that he knew about the embargo before he sent it. So the explanation doesn't really ring true. Um, that wasn't the end for Prentice, though. Um, we, we find out that Prentice allegiance, allegiance to the colony of Virginia were really very hollow. Uh, in December, less than a month later, Prentice received another shipment of luxury goods from Britain. This time from Scotland, from Edinburgh, containing gold, uh, silver plated tableware, a, a luxury good that was definitely on the embargo list. This time, Prentice, when the ship arrived, was very open about it. He came to Yorktown to the Committee of Safety in Yorktown and fessed up and admitted that he'd, he'd ordered it um, and that it was a uh, embargoed good. He turned it over to the Committee of Safety in Yorktown and it was sold to support the people of Boston. So, the important parts that I want you to remember about the, the Yorktown Tea Party. First off, it happened. We had one. But we were one of many. There were many tea events throughout North America. Tea was widely rejected because of, the, of all the reasons that we've <laughs> just gone over. Um, the people of Yorktown, there were no Tories in Yorktown. Yorktown was unanimous, unanimously in support of the embargo and the, and the destruction of the tea. Uh, and unanimous, unanimously supported liberty. But what happened at Yorktown, because of the timing of it, did send an essential message to the people of Boston that the rest of the colonies were behind them and that we weren't going to cave to the British pressure. 
And the last thing it did is it cemented Thomas Nelson's reputation as a leader and a patriot. And of course, you know, he went on to become a member of our Continental Congress delegation, a signer of the Declaration of, of Independence, the commander in chief of all Virginia's forces during the Revolutionary War, and the third governor. And that's what it looks like last year. <laughs> and of course, we will do it again on November 11th this year, which is not on the anniversary, but the closest weekend we could get. And you're all invited. And with that, I'll take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. If you have a question for Mr. Nelson, let me bring the microphone to you, speak directly into it so we can get the, uh, this recorded for posterity. <laughs> Anyone has a question? All right, we'll start up here in front and work our way back. Just interested in what time on the 11th? What time on the 11th? I believe I it will be approximately noon for the we, dumping. Now, which event are you talking about, sir? It's the, York, the recreation of the Yorktown Tea Party. Yes, okay. At noon on the 11th. And it's going to be exactly where? At the waterfront. I mean, uh, we, the Luna will be tied up. The tea will be aboard the Luna. It's, it's nice that we know of illegal tea arriving before it does. <laughs> um, so uh, we, On we the will water, waterfront pier. Okay. It'll be down that area. The event information will be on the York County Tourism website calendar. York County website calendar. This gentleman had a question uh, here. Yes, sir. Let's be a little bit practical here. That box that you have there doesn't look like it got much, holds much more tea than a five-gallon bucket, for the love of me. <laughs> I mean... This, this is called a, a quarter chest of tea. Yeah. Uh, but actually, it's not a quarter. A tea, a tea box... Uh, was two feet wide, three feet long, and two feet tall. So th the simple math there is that there's 12 cubic feet of yeah. tea in, in one of those boxes. This is a one cubic foot box, which means that there are actually 12 of these in a, in a crate of tea, and a half crate would have six of these in it. So a half chest of tea was about 200 pounds yeah. worth of tea. Okay. How long would it But take yes, it? from a practical matter, we weren't talking yeah. about a lot of money. Well, this wasn't a very valuable cargo. Now, now this is loose tea. In a, in a quarter chest like this, this holds about 45 pounds of tea. The tea is compressed uh, very tightly in it. Um, 45 pounds of tea results in 53,000 of these. Okay. So it, it's a very substantial amount. Now, 40 pounds of tea at two shillings per pound is about... It's about four pounds, four, four pounds of British currency. So um, if you consider that a day laborer at that point in time earned about one penny a day, British soldiers were paid one penny a day, that box represents about four and a half years wages for the common man. Wow. So it is, it is, a, it is substantial value. People in Virginia would have looked at that as substantial value, but the John Norton in London, this was a good size to experiment with to see if we would accept the tea, to, for him to take a risk and test the waters, so to speak. Of course, that's exactly what did get tested. <laughs> Sir. Yes. If I may, if you, if you are Thomas Nelson again, could I ask what your esteemed uncle, Secretary Nelson, thought of all of this? Uh, you said that all of Yorktown was simpatico with all of this. Um, what, what, was his, what was his opinion of this? Secretary Thomas Nelson was remarkably quiet about the whole affair. Um, Secretary Thomas Nelson had been the Secretary of the Colony of Virginia, was on the Governor's Council, and had been so for about 35 years at this point. Um, he, he was considered the second most powerful Virginian in Virginia, the first being William Nelson, who was Thomas Nelson's father. Um, William Nelson was obviously in support, um, but Thomas Nelson, the secretary, who had more ties with other secretaries in, in Britain, was very quiet on the subject. He neither published anything nor wrote any letters that we have left in either support or, or uh, opposition to the Tea Party itself. And I think, um, importantly at that point, was 
the governor's council was becoming less and less important. It was important to Lord Dunmore, and he does reference it in, the, in his proclamation of November 1775. Um, but from the standpoint of Virginians, the House of Burgesses had increasingly taken on, taken on more importance towards Western Virginia. People like Madison and Jefferson, were, uh, George Wythe from Williamsburg, and Nelson also were part of this, this junto. Patrick Henry is another part of it. They were taking more control, and the political center of Virginia was moving further and further west. It's one of the reasons that the capital eventually moved to Richmond. Um, and because of that, it, the governor's council was becoming increasingly marginalized. So here in Virginia, people were not looking to William and Nelson and Thomas, Nel or Thomas Nelson, the secretary, uh, for their political guidance. They were looking to their own patriotism and their own feelings of liberty, and those, we, those were rising to the fore. That's a great question, thank you. We had a question from up front. Go ahead, honey, ask your question. Yeah. <laughs> so in your slides, you made reference to the, the only surviving box is in Boston. Is that right? We That's didn't correct. keep any souvenirs? That's correct. Um, this is one of the reasons that the destruction of the tea boxes is a myth. Only one box of, after the Boston Tea Party survived, um, and I did show a picture of it. Uh, I won't try to get back that far. but. Uh, it's called the Robinson Tea Box. It was picked up the morning after. It was on the beach at Dorster Neck in Boston, uh, half buried in the sand. A young 14-year-old man named Robinson was, was walking along. He saw it and picked it up, not as a souvenir, but to take home because it was a box. It was useful. Um, and he took it home, and it has survived throughout, throughout the ages. It's well, very well documented that it, of it being, uh, for a long time, we thought that there were two. And the other one was in the DAR Museum in Washington. But uh, in the last eight years or so, um, uh, forensic evidence um, has, has uh, revealed that that box was not at the Boston Tea Party. So we're down to one, and it's just the Robinson Tea Box in it. It is in the Boston, Party Tea, the Boston Tea Party Museum, which is on Griffin's Wharf in Boston. And you can go there and see it. It's on, uh, really nicely displayed. Have you checked all the addicts here in New York? <laughs> Yeah, we don't know where the crates went. They probably, uh, I would think that they stayed on board this, the ships. Um, the large crates of tea, as we were, we, we were discussing, the big, the full-size crates of tea, which held about 400 pounds, those were rather flimsily constructed. And the large crates were lined with lead to keep the product fresh coming over. Um, those crates were not recycled. But these small crates, you can see the small crates are much better constructed. And they effectively had a deposit return stamp on them. You know, if you live in Hawaii, in North Carolina, Vermont, you have to take it back and get your nickel. Um, but so these were the property of the British East India Company. So destroying these would have been destruction of property beyond the destruction of the tea. So the Patriots very deliberately did, attempted to not destroy the tea boxes, especially the small ones. Now in Boston, where they were, most of the tea was in the large chest, it's a different story. They may have well have just smashed them. But it, in Boston, uh, you can see from this picture, tea floats. <laughs> um, and, and if you left your own devices, in Boston, they, they tossed toss 92,000 pounds of tea over the side of the ships. Now, there were three ships. They were tied up at Griffin's Wharf. The tide was out. It was an abnormally low tide. The water underneath the ships, most of the ships were resting on the bottom in only two feet of water. So they couldn't dump the tea on the wharf side. All the tea was dumped on the harbor side of the ships. And it piled up so high that men could climb from the water up the pile of tea to get back on the ships. <laughs> and the reason that they had to do that was because they wanted to destroy the tea. Men were put over the side with oars to, to crush the tea and stir it into the water so that it couldn't be just picked up the next morning like that, that one bottle that was in the slides. Obviously, some of it did survive because people did pick it up. Um, and we have some that survives today. That's not the only sample uh, that's left over from the Tea Party. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> did, did we have any other questions? All right, just a moment. I come from the future and thank you for your patriotism <laughs> to this country. Could you um, kindly indulge us and um, 
be a little less humble and tell us about the types of sacrifices you and your family made for the country, um, a $3 million personal loan, putting that into terms financially of what that meant, um, you know, toward the end of the revolution and such, please? Yeah, uh, so at the time it wasn't $3 million, that's a, that's a uh, translated figure in today's, today's value. It, and the, at the time it was $280,000. Um, well, it was, it was enough to put me into penury. <laughs> um, the, uh, now, at the time that that loan was in, so what, what she's referring to was that in, in 1780, well, let me begin a little farther back, Continental Congress was, was levying funding for the war from each of the colonies. And Virginia's share in the year of 1780 was $280,000. Now, today, at, at the current exchange rate, that's well over $3 million. Um, however, at the time, the, those were continental dollars. Remember that we were 13 individual states, sovereign states in our own right. We were printing money too. The, we, uh, and each of the colonies was using the pound system, the British pound system. So we were, we were issuing pence, shillings, and pounds. And Virginia currency stayed healthy resisted inflation much better than continental currency. And that's because Virginia currency was backed by tobacco or flax or hemp. Every January, the Virginia legislature, after the start of the war from 76 on, the Virginia legislature would state, would pass a law stating how you could pay your taxes. And it would state that you can pay your taxes in Virginia script, and it would say how much that is, continental dollars, and it would say how much that is, or in flax, hemp, or crop products. And it would say how much that is. So you could do this translation of how much, how much a bushel of wheat is worth relative to the Virginia pound and the continental dollar. By 1780, the continental dollar was worth about, it took 70 continental dollars to equal a Virginia pound. Um, by 1781, it took 220. So when Nelson loaned $280,000 in that 70 to one ratio, it really, was about 4,500 Virginia pounds. At the end of the war, when the war was over in 1783, Nelson, Nelson asked the Virginia legislature to repay him. And the amount that he asked for, for all of his services during the Revolutionary War, was 11,000 Virginia pounds. By then, the, the Virginia pound had returned to its normal exchange rate. A committee of Virginia, uh, for the Virginia House of Delegates, was formed. It was chaired by uh, Madison. And they found that, indeed, Jeff Nelson was owed this amount of money. And the committee recommended to the financial, to the, to the treasurer of the colony that he be paid, and he never was. He was never paid. Now, 11,000 pounds in 1783 money, uh, Virginia pounds in 1783 at the, at the current exchange rate is about $1.1 million. So that's how much he really, he really did loan um, when you take all the exchange rates into company. Now, this was a cash loan. Um, so he had $280,000 worth of cash on hand, which is unbelievable for that stage of the war. He had out personally outfitted two Virginia regiments of infantry, one uh, troop of horse, of, uh, who was commanded by his uh, son Hugh. Um, he, had, uh, he had bought three ships for the Virginia Navy, and completely outfitted them with sails, and paid the sailors for six months' service. So his contributions to the Virginia, the Virginia war effort were massive. Uh, Virginia would have, would have defaulted out of Continental Congress if Nelson hadn't paid their debt in, uh, in 1780. Now, he didn't actually pay their, he did pay cash to Virginia, but what he did was he arranged loans. He co-signed loans with other people that did amass to a, to a greater debt. Um, and eventually Virginia came back on him, so where, where's the money? You know, the, the co-signers of the loan wanted to know, he personally guaranteed the repayment, so he did end up paying a lot of Virginians after the war. Um, so he, was, uh, he was very involved financially. He was involved personally. Um, he was asthmatic. Um, 
And in 1777, he had an asthmatic stroke on the floor of Congress while he was attending Congress. Um, it's one of the reasons that he returned here to Virginia. And of course, Virginians gave him, gave him all of two months off and then named him as the commander in chief of all their military forces, which meant he was right back into the field with the military forces. And of course, in 1778, we had, or 79, we had the Matthews Collier raid. In 1780, we had uh, the Leslie raid. And in 1781, Benedict Arnold shows up on our front doorstep raids across Virginia, and then Cornwallis joins him from, from Carolina. So Nelson was extremely busy throughout the war. Now, Nelson was also the commander-in-chief of Virginia's military forces going through 1781 when he was elected governor. And it's, gov it's Nelson's position as commander-in-chief of the forces of the state and the chief executive of the state that was used to model the presidency when our Constitution was written. As you know, our president is not only our chief executive, he's also the commander in chief of our military forces. So it's Nelson's, Nelson's installation of the principle of civilian control of the military that reigns on in the Constitution through today. So he is extremely influential. We forget about him often because he was not long lived. He died in 1789. Um, he had a stroke in July of, seven, oh, excuse me, 1788. He had a stroke. Um, it left him mentally debilitated. He was unable to communicate, and he died uh, just after his birthday. Uh, so he died on January 4th of 1789. Um, there's a lot that's been said about Nelson's will. After studying him uh, for as long as I have, I have concluded that he probably would have freed his slaves if he had been given the opportunity. But he didn't expect to die at the age of 50. Um, and when his will was written, it was signed by somebody on December 26th of 1788. And he was non compass mented at that point in time. So clearly he did not write his own will. Uh, but he had a long history. Um, I know many of you are familiar with the, the Thomas Nelson Community College and the change in its name. But Nelson had a long history of benevolent slave ownership. Um, he had attended the Peasley Academy across the water in Gloucester. Uh, whose director was the Reverend Young. The Reverend Young was one of the first abolitionists in Virginia. In fact, many of the prominent uh, children of Virginia planters were withdrawn from his academy from what was considered radical views about slavery. Um, Nelson's wife, Lucy, attended the same academy a few years behind him. While Nelson was at school in England from 1753 to 1761, the Reverend Young became the director of, the, of Bruton Parish in Williamsburg. And as the director of Bruton Parish in Williamsburg, he did things that were anathemic to uh, the, the white society of the time. He allowed black children to be baptized in the church. He married black people in the church. Uh, his view was that everybody's soul is the same in the eyes of God. Um, <clears throat> when Nelson and, and Lucy Nelson were finally married in 1762, they could have gone to her church at Abingdon, which was a prominent church at the time. They could have come here to Grace Chapel, which was Nelson's church. They bypassed both to be married by the Reverend Young at Bruton Parish in Williamsburg. And that tells us that he, there's more to the Nelson story than, than he's been previously given credit. During his political career, he voted nine times to either tax, limit, or abolish slavery. He was opposed to the U.S. Constitution on the grounds that it the Connecticut Compromise pushed the slavery issue down the road. He wanted to solve it then, and he believed that they, they had the votes to do it. Um, letters from his children revealed that he was also opposed uh, to the Constitution because it did not impose term limits. I think that was fairly prescient, <laughs> um, but that might be just me. Um, so he, he's much more interested, and of course, during the war, um, he he wrote letters back and forth with his cousin, George Washington, imploring Continental Congress and acted as a delegate in Continental Congress, imploring Continental Congress to allow slaves to serve in the Continental Army in exchange for their freedom. So he was, he's a much different person than, than um, he has been represented in uh, some of the studies about him, and I think he probably should be revisited. And of course, I am somewhat biased, so I have to you know, be upfront about that. Anybody else? That was a long Thank answer you. to a Thank you. Any other question. questions? Could you just give yeah. a brief definition of this Dogus tea? Did you call it Dogus? Bohe. Bohe. It's spelled oh, B-O-H-E-A. It's pronounced Bohe. Uh, Bohe is the dregs of tea. Um, it is the sweepings off the floor after the good tea 
is put together. There were seven different types of tea that were being sent to the Americas at that point in time. These small chests were generally used for the best stuff. Uh, they preserved the quality uh, to the utmost capacity. And the tea that came here to Yorktown was a higher quality. It was called uh, Sleeko, uh, Singlo, which was uh, single, it, it meant single highest quality, best quality. Um, so the tea that was here was the best quality tea. And of course, that's because it was destined for Williamsburg, where it was going to be served in the taverns of Williamsburg and to the House of Burgesses. So Prentice had, had a pretty unique contract. Um, the end story of Prentice, I never really finished it for you, but Prentice did not fare well as a result of his Im illegal importations. Um, he was called out. He was, um, he was chastised publicly both times for both the tea and for the silver, um, and it drove him out of business. Um, he announced in, uh, in uh, February of 1781, or seven, excuse me, 1775, he announced in the Virginia Gazette that he was intended to leave the colony. But before he could do that, his wife went insane under the pressure, and she was committed to the asylum in Williamsburg, which still stands today. Um, and he, just shortly after his wife was committed, he suffered a heart attack, lingered for a few months, and then died. The Prentice store went into receivership because he was the operating partner. Um, his partner, in conjunction with his nephew, William Prentice, purchased it, and it continues to this day as William and uh, as Prentice and Tarpley. Um, so what we have in Williamsburg today is not from our tea importer, it's from his nephew, William Prentice. Um, and so you can, you can shop there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one more question. And this will be real uh, simple, Mr. Nelson. Um, what's the best book written about you on the market that someone could purchase? Um, the, the best biograph biography of Thomas Nelson is actually a dissertation that was prepared for the University of Virginia. It was written in, in uh, about 1958. Um, the best commercially available book, there's two. There's a, a biography by a man named Webb, um, which is simply Thomas Nelson. Um, he also wrote a book on the Nelson family, which is really a great resource for those of us in the history business because not a lot is talked about his uncle Thomas. Um, the other book that's out there um, was written by, uh, by Nell Moore Lee. Uh, and it's an interesting book, not because of the fact that it, that it describes Nelson's life. It's interesting because Nell... Nell was, lived here in Yorktown, and she did a very thorough researching of the Virginia Gazettes of, of the period. And her narrative is not just about Thomas Nelson. It, it includes everything that was happening in the local area. It's, it's really, it, it really just takes those Vir Virginia Gazettes and puts them into narrative form. And it's, it's fabulously interesting. You learn who, who was dating who, what the Burgesses were doing, whose crops are failing, who's selling horses, where the slave trade is. It really is a good book for, for that purpose. It's not a great book on Nelson himself, but because of the... Uh, the broad view it takes of Williamsburg and Yorktown, it's, interesting. it's a very interesting read. Uh, so that's Nell Moore Lee. And it's called A Patriot Above Profit. So fitting name for Nelson's book. All right. Thank you, sir. Mr. Nelson, Mr. Gallagher. <laughs> Thank you.